It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Claire. Claire came to Tasmania six or seven years ago and at the next building along, I was then uh, Senator for Tasmania. We held a much celebrated press conference, Claire, <laughs> Claire at which she spoke about the uh, corruption of the logging industry in Malaysia and how that had spread worldwide. Uh, she was talking in the context of Ta An, the big uh, combine, one of the five big logging companies in Sarawak, a state of Malaysia, uh, having set up in Tasmania with a $22 million handout from the Tasmanian government at the time, as if the billionaire company itself didn't have enough money to establish here. And uh, she used the word corruption a couple of times during that press conference, hugely attended press conference, and there was zero coverage. Well, uh, it's wonderful that you persisted, Claire, <laughs> and uh, Jenny's just introduced uh, a little of what Claire's done. We'll be talking with, I'll be talking with Claire uh, a little bit more in a while, but first I'd like her to, and um, we've asked her if she would speak with you shortly about this remarkable uh, campaign as a uh, investigative journalist that Claire has run and doggedly persisted with, which as uh, Jenny just uh, said has led to, well, what's the Prime Minister, ex-Prime Minister's name? Um, right. I, we forget, don't we, oh, but we I do. think his name is Najib Raza. Najib Raza <laughs> wanted Claire in jail. And now she's here and he's in jail. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Claire Lucas. I hope this is uh, working. <laughs> yeah. um, watching this uh, put together that uh, Jenny and, and the team kindly made earlier uh, brought a few memories back to me, and, and, and particularly me grimly saying it's amazing what you can achieve if you focus and get on with it. <laughs> I, I guess I was setting myself um, a, a big target, I suppose, and um, now some four years after, after that particular interview, I think it is now, um, I, I come here in the aftermath of what has been an amazing development in Malaysia. Mm, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Um, an, an amazing development in Malaysia, um, where we saw in May a transformative event, um, a peaceful election that saw the transfer of power uh, from what had been the ruling party um, for six decades since the the advent of independence, the same political party had controlled the country and had totally entrenched itself, it had total grip of power. And uh, nobody, none of the experts, no Malaysians themselves um, thought that that could change. Um, I, I had this strong feeling that it could because I, as an outside observer and, and, and trouble stirrer, I suppose, um, I had an enormous confidence that had developed um, in the ability of Malaysians to, to get up and, and, and make that change. Um, and I think it's um, generally agreed uh, that a large part of why the population pretty much unanimously got up and voted against these criminals who had taken charge of their country was because um, of the 1MDB scandal. Um, which I had been working on and managed to expose and bring through the media. And it wasn't an easy job because obviously the Malaysian media is totally controlled, the mainstream media. Um, and pretty much immediately after I had exposed this story, my own internet site was um, under attack and was then banned. But nevertheless, thanks to all the mechanisms of new media <coughs> and the massive determination of um, Malaysians to distribute this story. Um, I was able to keep on with the investigation. It, it took nearly three years, bit by bit, unraveling what had gone on. Um, and um, you know, we managed to expose the fact that uh, the Prime Minister of their country had stolen $7 billion from their development fund and most of that had gone into uh, his own bank account and into the bank accounts of his collaborators and co-conspirators. Um, it was the most amazing story to cover, and um, indeed the largest uh, theft um, ever investigated globally, um, according to the United States Department of Justice. Um, so um, 
you know, it, it, it was a huge story and, and I had enormous fun actually um, unraveling it um, because uh, over that period, uh, you know, I, I was I was finding out what they'd spent the money on, <laughs> and um, you know, and it was like everybody was following following my blog as we would get more and more information of how the money had been stolen, who'd stolen it, and you know, they were buying super yachts, they were buying jets, Beverly Hills mansions, and I, I, I clambered into one of those and, and, and snuck around, and I was able to photograph this an enormous luxurious palace that uh, the stepson of uh, Najib Razak, the prime minister, had had bought and built for himself in, uh, in Hollywood. Um, and, and really it was, it was you know, it, it was something that held Malaysia spellbound and, and determined them on making that change. Um, and to me it was, it was understanding, you know, through experiencing really the power of journalism, you know, that little voice of truth. Um, and we can talk a little bit about the sort of lashback that I went through um, when a lot of money was thrown at um, all sorts of companies that were brought, you know, brought into operation to attempt to vilify me, discredit me, um, undermine, you know, what I'd been reporting on. Um, but but if you can get that that voice through, um, you know, people people will will be able to judge, um, and in the end, they judged that the story was was right. Um, but coming back here after after seven years, it, it was amazing actually I, that, that it took that long because uh, Bob picked up on me very early on in this campaign, as did Jenny, who was uh, waging her own war against the destruction of your forests here, largely for the benefit of a Malaysian company, Tar An, um, and that company was, as, as I had been reporting um, from my perspective back in uh, in Malaysia. It was very, very uh, tightly connected to the timber, timber mafias that I was writing about at the time. And, and coming back and revisiting all of this and, and, and being so honoured to receive a, an Environment Award from you uh, uh, today, uh, Bob, um, really helps me to reinforce why I got involved in this. Um, I was not covering this story because it was a high jinx, you know, high living tale of, of, of grand theft um, and, and global finance, which is what I ended up in the end, you know, analysing how the banks have been helping this, this kleptocrat steal the money and shuffle it around the offshore system and, and then invest it in the developed world in the way he had. Um, this, this was a, about a grassroots campaign to do with the environment and, and, and the people and, under, and, and learning really from seeing an environmental outrage and, and a human outrage, the people living in East Malaysia, had really focused my mind on what caused it and the cause was, was poor governance driven by corruption and greed um, and, and it really, the, the, the the example of Sarawak, which was where I started, reminds us all of, of, of the impact, the real impact of corrupt government, of, of government carried out for the benefit of a handful of people who've got the, the power over decision making instead of for the greater good. And, and this is why it's so pernicious. This is why kleptocratic government and, and you know, the, the turning of a blind eye to that sort of exploitation of vulnerable communities and vulnerable countries um, it, it is such a, a, a blight on our on our whole planetary organisation. Um, and you know, when I went out to Sarawak in 2006, that was what prompted my whole campaign. I had been born there. I was a little Malaysian for the first eight years of my life, running around in this beautiful jungle paradise, which was how I remembered it. And when I left, as one was, sent off to boarding school, um, I remember just looking out of the window and seeing that receding glorious canopy. It was my last memory of Sarawak. And I didn't come back until I was in my mid-40s, and I flew back in over those oil palm plantations. And it, it was a, you know, it was an absolutely riveting experience for me in the worst possible way. Um, and I made it my business to connect with the local people. I went up into the remaining jungle areas, uh, and I discovered very rapidly the appalling impact it had had on the local people and why this was going on. And that's why when I came here to Tasmania and we were starting to talk about those issues that connected us, I used the C word. I said, this is about corruption and it's not about politics, 
It's, you know, it's not about your opinion or left or right. This is about people who are breaking the law, exercising criminal breach of trust um, you know, over their positions of responsibility, which is to represent their people and do well by their people. And, and that's where I took it on at that level, as, um, you know, as, as people who were acting as criminals in positions of power. And that took me on a little journey. And, 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 you know, I can talk for an hour and a half about that little journey, but I, I know that we're going to do it in conversation, Bob. Um, but as you can see, it involved me uh, looking at what opportunities I could, I could exploit. I was a journalist. I'd been a television reporter during my working life. And so that's what I knew how to do. Um, and um, the internet had just arrived in glorious English language in Malaysia around that time. And I realized I could um, reach out to uh, the urban connected communities through the internet um, and started up my site, Sarawak Report. I wanted to make it sound really sort of, you know, purposeful. Um, and um, and, I, and it, I exploited the fact that I was an, ex an investigative journalist. Um, and so, you know, I got stuck into what I knew, which is, hey, well, let's, let's expose these guys and let's do it in a sort of kind of professional way. So you <coughs> nail them, you know, you really, you know, you make sure your facts stick. Uh, and this was something I could see was, you know, there was a lot of opposition, a lot of discontent in Malaysia um, that couldn't, of course, be articulated in the mainstream media and wasn't being properly articulated. It wasn't being professionally done online. And so that was the service I sought to uh, provide. Um, and um, very soon got stuck into exposing the um, criminality of the Chief Minister of Sarawak, who happens to be one of the richest men on the planet. Um, and that was a whole project on its own, which, which brought me to, to you here. Um, and, and at the same time realised that in order to reach the, the rural communities, I needed to find another mechanism, another medium. And um, I discovered that, of course, shortwave radio, that almost redundant medium that... I had used, when we were young, all over the world, we used to tune into the crackly old BBC World Service on shortwave. I realized I could get this quite cheaply, you know, nowadays, when no one was using these old transmission uh, stations. And I found someone who, who, who worked in this field and uh, lived quite near me in London. Um, and I managed to get some, some financial support. Um, and we started that radio station. Um, I got a couple of activists who risked everything um, and, you know, when people say, I'm brave, I, you know, it doesn't begin to compare with the bravery of, of local people who are, whose home Malaysia is, who stick their neck out. And they came and stayed with me in London, and for six months we targeted uh, the state elections in 2011 um, and found we made a huge impact by having this indigenous radio station. Um, and, and we managed to then take it on. And I ran that station for nearly six years until the jamming got so bad. They put so many millions of dollars into covering Sarawak with um, these kind of jamming operators that we actually we, we became something. It just became a, a, a losing game. Um, so um, and there's a, a little Belgian guy who made himself very rich selling those damn things. And we exposed him, actually. We, we, <laughs> we, we, went and, we went and posed as a dirty African dictatorship that needed some jamming, and we got him on camera secretly saying he'd supply it. So I've had a lot of fun doing this, Bob. <laughs> and I, you know, I think I should uh, just let's drift into conversation, um, and I, hopefully I'll be able to tell you a bit more about it. <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I should say that we have Claire's Sarawak report with us tonight. A special consignment has just arrived today. If you want to be amongst the first people in Australia to be able to buy this book, it's for $30. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Very cheap. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's a, a terrific read. It's much more than we can talk about tonight. But Claire, you uh, at eight went off to boarding school in London. Uh, what were you doing in S Sarawak in the first place? Well, I'm that old. Um, my, <laughs> my parents were part of the colonial service and they stayed on after independence. Uh, my father was working actually in, um, well, I, sort of in the colonial police force actually. Um, although it was a little bit more complicated than that, he was, uh, there were a lot of um, intelligence operations going on with the communist insurgencies and so forth, and he was involved in a lot of that, and my mother went over as a nurse. 
and started, uh, she was a midwife and she was trying to bring better uh, health services to um, these very, very remote regions. Um, and really, it, it breaks my heart, you know, I've got these black and white photographs of her and here's a little baby and, and her nurses that she trained so proudly and she, she was doing her best to help these people um, and, and to see progress and, and to go back to the same communities and to find that after five decades of utter exploitation of their jungle, of the ripping of their forests and all their national resources from under their feet, they don't even have it. They have no health services practically um, and um, you know I, it was a very poignant moment um, going up river um, as I went to visit one of these communities um, which had been suffering attacks from logging gangs particularly the rape of their women and um, we met a, a little consignment a little party coming down the other way um, very mournful with a very sick baby um, I, you know I, I really hope the child made it didn't look as if it would there were several more hours of downriver travel for them before they could get to a hospital um, to take care of this child. And really, you know, the thought that billions and billions had been taken out of their forest, out of their lands, and there wasn't even a system for rescuing situations like that, it made, my heart, it made me so angry and sad. Those were the sorts of things that have kept me going, really. But you nearly didn't get here because you were going up river in the dark. <laughs> in a canoe with a nine inch, or was it nine centimetres? It was very, it didn't feel very. And you heard safe. the swish and bump of a man eating, or woman eating, crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you had to get ashore in the dark where these crocodiles uh, are around about. And there was somebody called Helen there. And what was her advice? Well, Helen. I, she was Eba, very a very cosmopolitan and, and polished lady who was actually um, the only Eba who was given a job in Petronas, which is the oil company in Malaysia, and, you know, dominated by West Malaysians who were taking all the oil out of Sarawak, and, and none of the benefits were going back to help with development. And so, so I was going up to see Helen's village because Helen's village was one of the last ones that hadn't been logged out. And um, she, she and her sister were, was a radio presenter, actually. And they'd sort of got me involved. And I'd snuck in, Bob. I, you've obviously read the book. I'm, I'm impressed. Um, I'd had to, by that time, I'd been banned from Sarawak because I'd, I'd gone with a bunch of Australian journalists, actually. And we'd filmed um, a, a logging blockade, which seemed a reasonable thing to do. There was some Paman, and they were trying to stop the logging of their lands and so forth. And, um, and um, of course, uh, we were punished on our return back down to uh, to the coastal town that we were at, we were we were stopped at an armed blockade um, and marched at gunpoint in the pouring rain to the local police station. Our passports taken a note of, and that was me banned from Sarawak. Um, so in order to get back into Sarawak uh, to do this story, um, I'd had to sneak over the border. So I was always already kind of nervous about everything, you know. Um, and um, so then we get to this village. And I realised it's nine at night because the jeep had broken down and we didn't get to the, to the village that we needed to start off till nine at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they were very, very anxious. The whole village were waiting up river uh, for us to go and visit them and to talk, you know, to, so I could do this story about how the sister of the chief minister's company was trying to illegally log out their mountain that was one of the remaining places that was still forested. And we had to go up in the dark in this rickety little uh. little longboat um, with a little putt-putt engine. And, and Helen's husband, Numpang, was standing in the front with a torch like this. And, and, and <laughs> Helen says, don't worry. And, and I've been told by the people who dropped me off they wouldn't come with us because they weren't locals. And I said, why, why don't you come with us? They said, no, 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 this is a very dangerous crocodile river. We're not going anywhere near it at night. <laughs> so I thought, I was beginning to, you know, but I thought I've got to do it, it's my only chance. And Helen seems cool, you know, she's, she, she, and she's very cosmopolitan and, you know, I'm sure she wouldn't be taking a silly risk. <laughs> so, so I sit there and so I say, so, so what's with the crocodiles, Helen? Do they come out at night? And she said, yes, they do. She said, but we, Iban, we're not worried about crocodiles. She said, we tr they are our ancestors. They don't harm us, only foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> it 
Claire's book, she says there's 42, I think, uh, Indigenous groups in uh, Sarawak and Sabah, and none of them have been able to retain their forests. In fact, 97% are gone. But we have a little, uh, just before we move on to the corruption, we have a little film here, just four minutes, of the Penan people speaking about their plight, uh, which of course has been part of the, the plight that Claire has been fighting to redress. เนี่ยนะบันเป็นนี่อุ่นอาเวลปะตัวเมเบจัมมาดิไซตะทิปินาอุ่นเมเซตะทิปตัวปุปนีอาเวลไซตะสะจิลวะอุ่นเมตุก
ni tasak tan nak balik tanpa panai tu kau nak lama anak rangai tu ni kubah anak rangai tu pergi tam tuai dua pun lebih lah punya sini kena ni kami jumpa aku anak ni tasak You must have seen quite a lot of that. Were you surprised when you went back after 40 something years though to see what you did? Well yes and no. I mean I'd, I'd, I'd followed what was going on in Sarawak um, and I, I remember as a student really sort of seeing the Borneo fires on television. There was so little reporting but that was reported and, I, and, and really that was when I knew that eventually um, when I could, when I got my chance, I would come and try and do what I could. And, and, and that's really where I start, and I think that's where we all start. We're all activists, mainly in here, and we all do what we can about what, you know, what, what we know about and what is personal to us, and, and each of us make our stand. And in our small way, we each of us together make a difference. That, that, was, that was why I started on this. Um, and go, you know, so much of, of, of what we saw with the Penan, it, it reminds me of just how, how knowing they are. Um, and I had these conversations with them too. And they understand so much better than so many of the people who tell us about the need for progress and modernization is their great sort of um, she believes. But um, these people really understand the environment and the importance of their forest and they're so knowing about it. And they educated me a great deal about um, the other effects of the deforestation that was going on around them. They understood very well uh, the issues of erosion. And, and they talk a bit, I mean, not only did it pollute their rivers and, and kill the fish, um, uh, added, of course, to the fertilizers and the, pe and the pesticides that made, made um, you know, th th actually these, these waters almost poisonous in, in several situations. Um, and in fact, created, a, my, my experience on the Crocodile River was made all the more terrifying because um, these uh, you know, fertilizers had leached into the river and were creating these, these ex excessive plantation life. So there were these great beautiful lilies that were floating at us that looked fabulous in the dark with the torchlight but actually were perilous for us because they were going to turn over the boats. And, the, and so the rivers are clogging up. They've gone a red blood colour from the earth that's pouring into them. And, and the lesser rivers are already disappearing because the earth has just you know, kind of filled them up. And the Panan that I was talking to, they were explaining, you know, in a, in a rainforest, the earth is very shallow because, um, you know, there's so much uh, life and, you know, the plants are eating and turning around and it all goes into the canopy. So once you've removed those trees and, 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 you know, and their retention of their roots and you put in these lousy palm plantations that have no sort of kind of grasp at all on the soil, you know, the, the, the earth was just washing away. And, 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 you know, plantation of, of, of oil palm is not going to be able to continue for forever, maybe just a few more decades, before actually you're facing a potential or the likelihood, the inevitability, unless we do something about it, of total desertification as, these, as, these, um, as the, soils, the soil just goes into the rivers and out into the sea. Um, well, you say that um, the people knew what was happening to their surround, but this is a democracy. So why aren't they? Why weren't? Well, Tay must have been their representative. This uh, strong man who was mm. who's headed government there almost since the year dot. Yes. Well, I, I very soon discovered, of course, that um, none of these indigenous people have been given, you know, voting rights. They haven't been even given identity cards. They aren't even given their birth certificates. Um, it's a deliberate, just non-personalising of them. So, so, these, so I, I would say, well, why not? This is outrageous. Why don't you campaign? And, and you know, I had so many stories about how efforts were made to get these people registered. And, and it was, it's like a sort of Kafka-esque bureaucratic nightmare that's deliberately enforced against them. You know, there's a procedure for getting your, your birth certificate and your IC, but they made it too difficult every time for these native, dispossessed native groups to actually get their ICs. So they can't vote. They do not have a voice, even though they're the indigenous native people. Well, Tai was the head of state. He still is the head of state, isn't he? He's governor, but he was, prime, he was uh, premier. I think a more accurate word is owner. He <laughs> owns the economy owner. of Sorrell. But he, he was repeatedly re-elected. 
Um, why wasn't he responsive to the Indigenous people in this representative democracy? He told me, I've only met Taib once, um, you know, the, 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 the occasion that I was able to be there before I was barred from the country. <clears throat> And I was in a press conference, and it was one of these staged press conferences. It was a bit embarrassing. I didn't know why I was dragged along. Anyway, so we were invited to ask questions. So I, I asked that question. You know, I said, what about the Penang people? You know, you've, you've given us a lecture about your wonderful industrialization um, program. Um, and he said, oh, they're just, they belong in a museum. They're the past. He dismissed them, and, and, and they were extreme. When, when, when uh, representations were made about the vicious uh, rape attacks by logging um, gangs on, on their villages, you know, when the men were out trying to hunt these, the, girl, the women lived in fear, um, they said, oh, well, they're, they're very easy with their morals, these uh, Panam people, you know, um, you know, you, you can't, it's not the same as, as good Muslims like us. He, he also... <laughs> He also had that statement that's burnt into my mind that rainforest, it brings the rain. Uh, it ruins my golf. The sooner it's gone, the better. But he was educated in Adelaide, if I'm not wrong. Yes, well, I'm sure nothing to do with good Australian morals. <laughs> um, yes, he was. And... Um, what I started, I, 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 how do you get a grip on this? You know, you've got someone who's got total control of the media, total control of the economy, the country. He'd used his, he had total power. I mean, when he, when he took power, he did a deal. Um, it was an illegal deal with the Malaysian government in 1974. Um, he was actually at that time a federal minister and his uncle was the chief minister of Sarawak. And between them, they enacted with uh, Najib Razak's dad, who was then prime minister of Malaysia, it's, it's all in the family, um, they enacted the Petroleum Development uh, Act, um, which gave all of Sarawak and Sabah's oil to Malaysia, West Malaysia, the federal government. Um, and um, this was something that was in the, um, under the control of constitutionally of the states. It was state resources. So it needed to be ratified by the state parliament. But Taib and his uncle um, just signed it off and didn't get it ratified. It was illegal. Um, but that has been the um, system under which uh, the federal government of Malaysia has benefited from all Sarawak's oil uh, for, since 1974, and very little of the revenues have gone back to Sarawak. Um, and um, that was a deal. In return, they left him alone to do what he liked in Sarawak. Um, and when he came back and took over from his uncle, he appointed himself as chief minister, as uh, economics minister, and as natural resources minister, planning and development minister, he put himself in charge of every single the timber, the timber <coughs> industry council, the development council, uh, the land development agency, which distributed all the lands of Sarawak. He was in charge of everything that mattered, uh, and the few things that he wasn't in charge of, he put you know his stooges into. Um, and so, using that position of total uh, political control, he then diverted, privatized. He had a big privatization program, and guess where he privatized all the state um, assets? Into his own family companies. Um, and um, he's made himself one of the richest men on the planet. Um, he took control of, of all the logging licenses, which he handed out without a say-so to anyone, got rid of any, of course, no, no transparency you know, in the negotiations. And those logging contracts went to companies, obviously, that he controlled and, and to a large extent secretly owned. Um, one of those, of course, being Ta'an, which is um, ostensibly owned by his cousin, who also has a number of key controlling positions in the state as his proxy. That's Hamid Sapawi. You, I guess you see him quite often when he pops into <coughs> Hobart to look at um, his mills here at Ta'an. Um, now, um, by this method, Taib has made himself secretly possibly the richest, but certainly one of the richest men on the planet. Because he, in the subsequent three decades, cut down a jungle. He cashed in a jungle. Um, and um, so what I set about doing as an investigative journalist was to look at that wealth. I mean, the guy had been in public office um, ever since he was in his early 20s, thanks to his uncle. Um, so he'd had a very measurable and rather small <laughs> and modest salary. 
Um, yet he was known for his fleets of Rolls Royces, his extraordinary ostentation, his jets, um, and, and all sorts of secret foreign properties. And I set about exposing those foreign properties. Um, and, it, you know, I broke that story about the Adelaide Hilton, the, um, the great gifts he'd made to um, Adelaide University. We, I started to find that, that and in fact, we've now got another journalist who's come back to, and I really hope, an Australian journalist, he's going to bring out this story because there's a wonderful company <laughs> um, which is clearly connected to Taib and, and his interests um, with the name of Conceal. Actually, and Conceal has the most extraordinary property portfolio, um, and um, we've got people digging away at the moment at that because um, you know that still hasn't been completely um, explained and, and, and unwound. Um, and then I started looking at his other, um, you know, uh, possessions, extraordinary possessions um, across North America in Canada, um, the UK. Um, and, and uh, you know, in Japan and all over. Um, and, and it, it, you know, I spent about a year and a half just wading my way through this extraordinary, extraordinary corruption and wealth that he had. Uh, and again, uh, with investigative journalism, it's always, in the end, the best stories come from the insiders who come and talk to you. And um, one of the big breakthroughs I got on Time the Moon was. Um, an American guy called Ross Boyer, who um, had um, been, uh, he had a job looking after the uh, North American investments of the Tide family. Um, and I'd heard about him, I'd heard he'd fallen out with them. Um, and I, I'm going back to about 2011 again. I, I tracked down Ross um, and he showed me all the papers he'd kept showing this extraordinary property empire that the Tide family had in North America, um, including actually the Seattle uh, building, tall building called the Abraham Lincoln Building, uh, that housed the uh, Northwest headquarters of the FBI. So um, Tide was actually the landlord for the FBI in Northwest America. Um, and a very influential man. I mean, his political connections, he was closely uh, associated with Rockefeller. Um, he'd been involved, he was there at the front row of the Bush inauguration. Um, these people who get enormous wealth soon begin to build their connections with the, the players in, in the centers of power globally. Um, and that's what the Tide family had done. They had a massive, massive portfolio in Canada where his daughter had settled and got married to a local Canadian. Um, and um, it was really the information from Ross Boyer that gave me real insights to really hit and ask Tide Mahmood, um, you know, where he'd got his money and, and to register that. Claire, um, before we go to from, move from state, from Hobart to Canada, I mean from Kuching to Kuala Lumpur uh, and the national situation, why on earth did you keep going? Well, maybe I'll go back to what happened to Ross Boyer. Yeah. And that might give you an idea of why I got to a stage where you couldn't turn away from this. Because Ross was in legal dispute with the Tibes for having taken them on. And when I met him and his wife, they were, they were in a desperate situation. They'd gone from having a pretty good lifestyle, a decent salary, they'd worked for the Times as they're managing all their properties for many years. Um, they were living out of their car because legal costs had, had driven them to that. Um, and um, they were in a very, very, very tremulous situation when I met them. And they were being bullied and stalked and frightened by um, a private detective firm that had been um, spooking them deliberately. And, and I was able to get evidence that this private detective firm had been going around sort of uh, visiting people that he was trying to get jobs from and, and, and kiboshing that and explaining that there were legal issues to do with them. Um, and it was a very, very tenuous and, and, and frightening time and, and um, I and, and Lucas Stralman from the Bruno Nansa Fund, we, we did our best to reach out and try and be supportive to Ross, um, but he didn't make it. Um, and uh, there's a lot of mystery surrounding how he managed to kill himself by putting a plastic bag over his head. And um, it was written off as a suicide. 
Um, but, uh, you know, he was just one of many very tragic outcomes, people who've taken on these, um, these forces, and you start to feel that you have to keep, um, you have to keep up the struggle. Thank you, Claire. Uh, you know, um, in a way, Claire's answered my question by pointing out what an extraordinary, frightening situation she was moving into, but she kept going. And, and that is the extraordinary difference with most of us who, when we run into great problems, great difficulties, misfortune that you think is foul play happening to somebody else will back off and mind our own business. And of course, that's what makes you, if you don't mind me saying so, Claire, extraordinary. But tell me, before we do go to Kuala Lumpur, what happened to the gentleman driving down the street in Kuching? This is the, the fellow who was assassinated. Um, oh, right, yes. Um, actually, that was linked, that was Kuala Lumpur. That was Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. Um, was it? This was Kevin Moret. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, um, again, you know, um, these, these um, terrible scenarios, you know, are still shrouded in imponderables. And, and hopefully now we have a change of government, a lot of these issues can be looked into again. There have been a lot of disappearances and murders. Um, perhaps uh, what happened to Kevin was, was, was one of the most um, chilling, I think. It was at the height of the 1MDB scandal. Just, uh, just Kevin was a prosecutor. <laughs> um, well, come back a little bit. Yeah. Um, I had worked on these, um, these scandalous situations in East Malaysia. We kind of exposed Tive, and, and then actually there's a, there's a neighboring state suburb, which I'd also lived in as a child, um, which had a, a, an identical parallel situation and another very, very corrupted chief minister. And I was able, again through a wonderful whistleblower who managed to pass me all his bank statements, I was able to expose how he'd um, managed to um, circulate a, around about $100 million in timber kickbacks. Um, and he'd been handing out logging concessions where he shouldn't have been, naturally and destroying Sabah in the process. He was funneling these through proxies, through various offshore companies, BVI and Caymans, and, you know, and using HSBC Bank and then UBS Bank into his Swiss bank account in Zurich. Um, and I was able to expose this. And, and, and delightfully, actually, that case is, is now being prosecuted against UBS for money laundering uh, by the Swiss authorities. So you get there. But nothing was happening in Malaysia. And the reason nothing was happening in Malaysia was because all this, as I've explained, was being condoned. There was a deal. There was a deal with East Malaysia, which was that the local despots could continue doing what they wanted as long as they delivered the votes and the oil to the central government, thereby assisting that 60 years of uninterrupted government Centrally. Um, so that was how it worked in Malaysia. And I realised that the only way we were going to change anything um, and you know, have any hope of a better governance um, for the East Malaysians and the, and the jungle was to, um, to, go f to get a change of government and to expose um, what was going on centrally and find myself really looking at the pinnacle of power, which was the Prime Minister, the highly corrupted Prime Minister in Malaysia. Um, and that's why I started, you know, this, this is where this adventure led, um, you know, looking at the activism on the ground to do with uh, Sarawak and, and, and the jungle and, and suddenly finding myself um, exposing the Prime Minister. Um, and I did that because I, I got a handle on this development fund that he had um, started shortly after taking power in 2009 called 1MDB. And he touted it as a, you know, a brilliant uh, device for borrowing a whole lot of money on the public purse, and then he was going to invest it in brilliant, you know, government-backed projects that would deliver profits, of course, that could then make life better for the poor. Um, but of course, by the time I'd started looking at it in 2014, it was obvious that that money uh, was just disappearing, actually. Um, nobody knew where it was being invested. Um, the, the accounts weren't coming in. Um, they changed the accountancy firms three times. You know, there were so many questions and already the opposition were beginning to look into this. And, uh, you know, I, I'd better tell you a little bit about it because um, there was a very flamboyant character 
named Joe Lo, who was a young Chinese Malaysian businessman, um, who was uh, publicly known as the guy who was assisting and advising Najib Razak um, on this supposed development fund. Um, and Joe Lo had become globally notorious as a massive spendthrift. And he was described as a billionaire in the American and European press because he would go around and just wow everyone by spending the most ludicrous, ostentatious, outrageous amounts in nightclubs and casinos and you know and Hollywood and all the rest. And so everyone in Malaysia was, was following Joe Lo and wondering what this was all about. Um, and, 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 and people were criticizing the fund that was losing money. And um, this all coalesced for me uh, in 2013, late 2013, when a movie came out at the end of that year called Wolf of Wall Street. And I was ticked off that the producer of that $100 million movie was a young man called Reza Aziz, who was the stepson of Najib. And I thought that was interesting, and I looked into it a little bit more. I thought, well, you know, you know it's an awful film. And how does this young man who's had, you know, a two-bit, you know, uh, career as, a, as an assistant at HSBC in London for two years, how does he suddenly manage to invest $100 million in a movie? Um, and as I was investigating all of this and looking online, over Christmas, um, leaving my mother to do all the work, uh, um, I suddenly saw it there in plain sight. Every single picture of this young man, the producer, Reza Aziz, together with Leo DiCaprio, who was the, um, the star of that rather obnoxious film, um, was there with them was Joe Lowe. And it just fell into place. I could see it. You know, so I wrote, I wrote an article, my first article about 1MDB, which basically asked, you know, is there a connection between the fact that Joe Lowe is the advisor on this fund that has lost um, a calculated $12 billion in the last two years, and um, the fact that uh, the, the son of the Prime Minister is, is popping up uh, financing $100 million movies? Um, I just asked the question, that's what journalists do. Um, and I got a lot of legal pushback, a lot of legal letters, <laughs> and also some interesting emails. I can tell you more. Come to Hollywood. So I did. And I came to Hollywood and found out that there were all sorts of massive properties that this young man unaccountably owned as well. And so I was able to put a lot of pressure on them. I was able to hold off the legal threats. And that was the beginning of the adventure on 1MDB. And, and Kevin? Kevin, when I had, um, you know, after, after a long time, I, I was able to dig up that, yes, the answer was the money, the money for the movie did get stolen from 1MDB, <coughs> along with a whole lot more, and, and there were whistleblowers along the way. Um, I dug and dug, it took me a year, and finally I got a whistleblower who was on the inside of the joint venture company that had done the first deal with uh, 1MDB and, and which they'd supposedly invested a billion dollars. But of course it was just a front, it was just a smoke screen. And in fact, you know, $700 million of that first um, billion had gone straight into a company account owned by Joe Lowe. Um, and that was the beginning of it. I mean, there were, you know, there were other investments that were similarly siphoned off by Joe Lowe. Um, and, um, I, so I, I ran with the story, and it created a, a satisfyingly large scandal in Malaysia. <laughs> Not globally, because um, the lawyers soon put paid to that, and, and there wasn't much global press coverage. But it was enough to start investigations going in Malaysia, um, and those investigations, for a while before Najib clamped down on them, kicked up a lot of information, including the fact that uh, 681 million of that stolen money had gone into Najib's personal bank account um, in KL just before the 2013 election to help him with that. And um, so by that time I'd created a massive, I published that story, I gave it to the Wall Street Journal, you did suddenly have international coverage and, and we created a total political crisis in Malaysia. Um, and Najib reacted 
by having a massive crackdown. So, I mean, I was, you know, I was, I was blasted out by that time, I was banned, charges on my head, you know, Interpol alerted and all that stuff. But meanwhile, he, he sacked his deputy prime minister, he sacked the attorney general and a number of others and, and cracked down and really just... Why did he sack the attorney general? Well, that's what I'm coming to. I'll get, <laughs> I'm getting there, Bob. <laughs> um, but so, so after he did all this, I had actually been in Hong Kong at the time, so I arrived kind of really, li I'd been chasing the diamond purchases that Joe Lowe had been making for Rosmer in Hong Kong and I'd got this great story that actually got completely drowned by all the political drama of, of how he bought um, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of, of diamonds um, with the stolen one MDB money. Um, but um, So I got back into London and, and I opened up my email box and there was this mysterious uh, message to say this is why um, Najib sat the Attorney General and there was an attachment, and it was a charge sheet. And I had to get it translated because it was in Malay, but I could see at the top, you know, the state versus Naz Najib Razak. And it was a charge sheet, um, basically um, bringing charges against the prime minister for um, stealing one MTB money. And that's what had prompted this counter coup. So I published the story. <laughs> Fingers crossed, I hope it's not a, you know, I, I decided I could be reasonably certain that they, it wasn't fake. Um, they immediately said it was fake, of course, and, and I was really, really nervous. I'd done my best to, to, to assure myself that it wasn't a fake. Um, but they, 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 they reassured me themselves within 24 hours because having issued uh, you know, a statement saying it was a fake, they then announced that they were, they were um, beginning a leak inquiry into <laughs> to have the document reached me. So, so then I knew, okay, it's genuine. I'm not going to worry. Um, but um, in, in the midst of all of this, um, as this battle was going on, um, it uh, emerged that a young prosecutor had disappeared, Kevin Morais. And through the grapevine, I, I learnt that the reason why the press was so worried about this was that he was believed to have been the young prosecutor that had helped the Attorney General um, draw up that charge sheet. And it very soon emerged that he had been pulled from his car in moving traffic in KL. Um, a gang of people had come up and rammed his car from behind. He'd stopped and, and, and they, he'd got out. He'd been dragged into another car behind him. Someone had jumped into his car. The next time it was seen, it was a burnt out wreck. And then he was found um, in a cement drum, concreted in, submerged in water, some days later. Um, now that again is a, is a um, yeah, there was a rush through uh, autopsy, the family were totally non-believing. They, they had a team, they demanded a second inquest and they had a team boarding from Australia a plane um, to go to KL to uh, conduct that second inquest and the body was, was taken out of the hospital without the permission of the family and cremated before that inquest could be done. And was the Attorney General still in office at this stage? Or the, no, the Attorney General had been sacked and yeah. was saying nothing. He'd actually, as I subsequently found out, had been sacked by method of... Um, he'd been retired on ill health, apparently, but he'd actually been marched... To spend marched, more time with his family. Well, and all of that. <laughs> he'd actually been marched at gunpoint as he, uh, up from was his it? office. Yes. Um, he's now back. He's now back as uh, in the new government, um, assisting with s these issues. Well, and we, we're getting towards the downfall of the Prime Minister, uh, which came through an election. But in the process, he, he had control, really, or the UMNO, um, the, the party, had control of the media. How did that watershed occur, that the, the stories... You've talked about a couple getting great coverage in Malaysia. How did... Did it just become too much for the Prime Minister of the day and the, and the, the boys in charge to suppress? Or, or what do you think happened there, Claire, with these revelations getting through to the public who were then going to change their vote? Well, I think one of the key things was that they couldn't actually... It, it's the new media. They couldn't actually keep the story out. The other crucial factor, actually, was, was for once, 
the global system did what it ought to do. Um, and you know, one of the big campaigns and, 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 and things that I've been working on you know, and, and learning about through Revealing One NDB has been how the whole global financial system assists these thieves and criminals and kleptocrats in sucking the money out of their countries um, through this ridiculous offshore system that enables them to hide and disguise it so that they, they can then have their North American empires. And um, this had been recognized finally as a threat, not just to the poor vulnerable people who are being thieved from, but actually to our societies as well, because you get these very unpleasant and, 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 and criminal characters um, wielding enormous financial and eventually political power in our own countries. So not only are we all responsible collectively for what's going on because of allowing this, this finance system to exist, but we're actually all um, we're all threatened by it as well. And the Obama administration got it. And they had set up a new anti-kleptocracy um, initiative. What's a kleptocracy? Hmm? Kleptocracy is theft by the people in charge, as opposed to a democracy, which is government. So it's government by thieves. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so the Kleptocracy Asset Recovery Initiative, um, which was a joint, a joint venture by the DOJ and um, FBI, had come into existence in 2014. And because of TIBE, I knew about it, but TIBE, they didn't want to do TIBE, it was old news. So I, I rang them up when I got all this stuff about 1MDB and I, I, there was a lot more I haven't told you about. I had a lot of whistleblowers by this stage. I had a massive information about his Middle Eastern, you know, the Middle Eastern aspects of, of 1MDB as well. So I, I had this number and I, I rang up, is that the kleptocracy you <laughs> <laughs> and, I got this, and they were very, very stern to deal with, you know, they said, yes ma'am, you know. So I said, well, I said, um, I wondered if you might be interested. I know you, you weren't interested in TIBE at the time, but I've got this quite fresh crime. And um, I said, would, would $700 million be kind of big enough for you to be interested in? <laughs> and they said, yeah, that would be big enough, madam. <laughs> so they took on the case. Uh, they came over and saw me in London uh, not long after I broke the story. And I, they shut me down it was quite nerve-wracking and, and you know they were very very stern and you know and then they went away again and of course you know I knew better than to knock on their door or whatever I let them get on with it and then a year after after all these sort of terrible um you know incidents that had happened I mean my other main whistleblower was jailed in Thailand for 18 months I mean they really went after us um, and I'm feeling very, very beleaguered. You know, we thought Najib was really, he'd got the whole country under control. My whistleblower's in jail, Kevin's dead, I'm under all sorts of siege. Um, and then um, I get this, I actually called them in, in America and, and I, because I was so worried about the wife of this whistleblower in Thailand, she was being threatened. I said, you know, can't someone, can't the America, can't you do something about this? And they said to me that day, Claire, I think you'll be happy with the timeline here. And that's all they'd say. And then the next day they walked out and had a massive press conference and just laid it down, a thick court dossier showing exactly how the money had been stolen, who'd stolen it, where it had gone, down to the bottom, the dollar they had it. And I was just vindicated. And of course, the impact of that on the Malaysian population. You know, I brought out this story, they'd all been following it. Uh, Najib had denied it left, right and centre, he'd sacked half his government, he'd thrown everything at it, he'd introduced all these crackdowns and new emergency laws again, huge powers, and then the and then the American government come in and show him up and, t and back up everything I said. And that was that was a big help. <laughs> I think that was a turning point. <laughs> What was going on? The Prime Minister was moving, or the, his government was moving to have a red alert on you. What does that mean? It means I'm a terrorist and that I should be arrested on sight in any country and, and, and shipped back to, to Malaysia to face charges of activities detrimental to parliamentary democracy. And what did you think about that? <laughs> Catch me if you can! <laughs> Well, it was, I was bemused. I mean, I was, in, I was sitting safely in London and I, I didn't really think that he, you know, they would get away with it. And actually Interpol did make a rare statement on my, in my case to, to, to tell the media that they had rejected Najib's request. And then 
the election came. Oh. And what happened? Well, um, there had been this kind of um, war of attrition for like a year between Najib denying everything and coming up with the, you know, the most ludicrous stories, you know, they're just unbelievable and, and, and you know, and, and, have, and, and stealing so much more money. He was having to steal money to, to pay off these um, debts they owed on 1MDB, which was 12, 12 billion dollars in debt. Um, and, um, you know, and, and it was really just, you know, who were the public going to believe? Were they going to believe me and the FBI and the DOJ? Or were they going to believe Najib, who said that he'd been given the money by a, an anonymous Arab royal who thought he'd done good in the Muslim world? Um, and if you said the other way, then you had to know that they were watching your Facebook and you could get into trouble for the, the new fake news law. For spread, you could be arrested for spreading false news if you, if you happen to say that you agreed with the FBI and uh, saw a report, as opposed to um, Najib. And everyone was very terrified, but they were angry, you know, and they're not that stupid. And it really got down to every guy in the village, this story. And, and the other key thing that happened was that um, the opposition, which had been very fragmented, and of course the leader of the opposition had been shoved in jail, um, they united just before the election. And I'd had my interesting involvement in that, actually, uh, trying to knock a few heads together when they came to London. And, and they united behind their old strongman, um, Mahathir, um, who had the confidence of, of the Malay community and was able to, to bring a really convincing alternative prospect for a government. And um, nobody thought they would win this election, least of all Najib. I think if he had, he had every power within his hands to declare a state of emergency and just skip the election. But luckily he, he thought that he was going to win it, I think, and then discovered that there had been a tsunami and everybody had voted against him. And, and he was out, Mahathir, at age 91, was, was back in and you've met him. What's he like? Well, you know, he's, um, he's a very impressive, he's a world leader. You know, and, and, and you have to give him that. I mean, he, there are very, very many people who had fought him, been in, put in prison with him, sitting next to him in government now, um, who had huge reservations about this old man. Um, but um, he was nothing like Najib. Um, he's not someone who's there for the money. He's not an Austin, he's a, he's a qualified doctor. What is it with these doctors? Um, he, he's, he, 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 you know, his idea of going shopping is to go to the bookshop, not to the, you know, not to the jet shop or the German ring shop. So they were very, and, and, and Malaysians could see that, you know, for all, for all Mahathir's, you know, irascible, strong arm, you know, uh, dictatorial um, reputation, he was not, a, a kleptocrat in the way that Najib was, and he he wasn't he wasn't someone who was letting letting the government fall into chaos in the way that Najib did. So people feel they've got um, good governance, and and also um, Mahathir has brought in part of the compromise was that he accepted the reform program of the opposition, um, which he's now committed to. And the first thing they were committed to was getting the leader Anwar Ibrahim out of jail, which which he has done. And Claire, you're talking about shopping. Uh, the former Prime Minister's wife was a shopper. Tell us what they found in her house after the police arrived in, uh, in the wake of the election. Well, I've learned a lot about, I mean, when I go shopping, I go to M&S, you know, and, and I buy the same shoes over and over, and over again if I find a pair that fit. So I've learned a lot about luxury shopping uh, from reporting on Rosman Mansour, actually. Um, there's a thing called an Hermes uh, um, Birkin handbag. Um, and these don't come in under $100,000. And she had 274 of them, <laughs> just knocking around the house. I can't uh, see how you could walk down the street with 274 <laughs> handbags, but must have a long arm. Well, I, I, it's my idea of a nightmare. Imagine having to sort of, you know, transfer your stuff all the time. <laughs> um, you'd lose your, your pen. Um, but she, she had so many jewels. I mean, they, they, I, 
I, I forget, you probably remember, I mean, there was something like, you know, three million dollars worth of cash and jewelry. I think it was actually 28 million. Oh, well, yeah, probably. Yeah. There were millions and millions of dollars worth of, of cash in the house, uh, uh, you know, uh, just just because they hadn't realized they were going to lose the election and, and hadn't had time to clear out. <laughs> Um, but that, that, that pales into insignificance um, compared to the, the masses and masses of money. One of my, one of my sources, and, and I have reason to believe he knows what he's talking about, told me that he had personally banked um, 40 billion ringgit on their behalf. I think you divide that by about three to put it into Australian dollars um, in, in offshore accounts for them. Um, in places like Hong Kong, and he reckons that they that they had a hundred billion ringgit to their name, um, and that's still distributed around the place. And I think that's why Najib is still fighting hard. He's he's got um, something like thirty six charges against him now, um, and they increase every day as as the government starts to you know work on 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 pulling together the charges against him and his wife. Um, but yet he's still work, walking free on on a massive bail, and. Um, I think they think that they can somehow buy their way back into power. I, I really hope they're wrong. Well, thank you, Claire. And one of, one of the things we can too easily get lost with in, in a story of mass corruption and stealing from the people through, even uh, after a democratic process here, is that all politicians are corrupt. And it's not so. We're Parliaments are only as good as two things, the people who elect them and the information which gets to those people. On the back of Claire's book there's two um, statements by current members of the Malaysian Parliament and one of those has been here to Hobart. This is uh, the Right Honourable... I need my glasses. Barubian. Barabian, thank you. And he says about Claire, it is clear that you are an active... No, I've got the wrong one. I'll go to the one above. We, I, let me read that one, seeing I've started. This comes from somebody on the other side called Rick Haythorn Thwaite, the operations officer of Petro Saudi, which gets a lot of story, you, that, uh, Petro Saudi Arabia. Um, and chairman of Global Mastercard, who says, It is clear that you are an active campaigning blogger rather than an objective journalist. <laughs> Therefore, even if I were to be in possession of information relevant to your query, you've written to him obviously, I would be unwilling to assist you in your questionable activities. There's the head of Mastercard International for you. But above that, uh, from the Right Honourable Baru, Bian. Bian. Uh, he's the Member of Parliament for Salango in Malaysia. It is, uh, I cannot overstate Claire's role in the changes that Malaysia is seeing today. Were it not for her dogged perseverance in digging for the truth, Malaysia would probably still be under the BN UMNO regime and fast rotting into bankrupt kleptocracy. Just tell us a little bit about this man. I, I understand he's a lawyer, isn't he? Yes, he's a native land rights lawyer. He's given over his life. He, he grew up in the, um, you know, in the hinterland as one of the tribal communities. He tells a story when he used to go to school. He used to have to walk for, for uh, a day through the jungle to get there. And then they would board. And um, he and his three brothers all managed to get an education by leaving their families and, 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 and going to these distant schools. Um, he then came and studied law in Australia. And I think he was here in Tasmania because his son was here. And um, he feels like, like those Penan people that you, you saw in the film. He feels passionately about the jungle and that. So that unlike most of the qualified lawyers who'd had the advantage of a foreign education, who all went and worked for the government generally, Baru uh, went into politics and went into the far less lucrative occupation of representing these penniless communities um, in their, uh, he had 400 land rights cases that he was fighting for them. And, and he won, he, f he was one of the earliest opposition people to manage to win a seat under the nose of Tybe. Um, and so we've been close working together over the years. Well, thank you, Claire. And if there's anybody uh, that, uh in politics, uh, and there are many that I respect, he's one of them, and he writes the most wonderful 
um, tribute to your work, a more extensive one at the front of your book, Claire. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for four questions, I can't end here without saying, uh, let's thank Claire Bluecastle very much. Thank you. Now, we'll have a short time for questions, and then Claire's going to sign some books, and um, we, we've got uh, a glass of water, if you like, over there, and we'll have a, a yarn around. But, uh, yes, question. Yeah. Um, what's happened to the media now that there's been a change of leadership? Well, it's been completely fantastic. Um, you know, I, I was vilified by the media, um, you know, which they had to, they had to do all, all through the period of running up to the election. And then when I came after the election, I suddenly found myself lionised, you know, front page articles by none less than the star, um, uh, who had been very, very anti me at the time, obviously they were forced to be. Um, and incredibly warmly welcomed. And of course, the media now realize that they're a free media. And one of the things I was saying to them is, well, you've got to do this now. I can shut up. You know, it's over to you now. You can, you can start holding authority to account. Um, and I think, you know, they're very nervous about it. It's a new mindset for them. Um, and, um, you know, I think it'll take a little bit of time after decades of, of, of self-editing um, to realize that actually, um, you know, they, they need to be tough. And, and brave in their, in their coverage. Um, but it's happening, and, and the new government is fulfilling its commitment to allow the media to be a free media. So um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an. Um, it, everyone in Malaysia seems to have a smile on their face these days. <laughs> Anybody else? A pig. Yeah, I'm going to ask Claire this because I already know the answer, but I think we need. Everybody needs to know. Has this resolved the problems in Sarawak in relation to petrocracy in Sarawak and the logging company? Yes, well, thank you, Peg. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that the one place where the, you know, the wave, the tsunami of change just didn't quite reach. I mean, they got rid of Musa Aman, that guy in Sabah I told you about, and he's, he's running, he's now being prosecuted for all his thefts. But they, they didn't manage to get rid of the uh, Sarawak, uh, you know, um, elite. The, 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 the political uh, situation in Sarawak remains the same, although, of course, they're no longer backed by the central government. Um, so um, the irony is all this was about in the beginning, um, trying to bring a better situation to Sarawak. And right now, Taib Mahmood still owns the economy of Sarawak and controls the political situation there. Um, so my last message in the book was that we, we've got to the, um, to the end of the beginning on this one. And there's a lot of unfinished business. Um, there's a state election in two years' time, Peg. Um, and um, you know, we'll be concentrating on focusing minds on that. Thank you. Yeah, just wondering how did you finance your, um, your investigations, like, from the mm. beginning? Mm. Um, well, in the very beginning, uh, at the t well, just before the, the radio, um, I, got, I got a small grant of a thousand pounds from the Bruno Mansa Fund, and that was the joy of the internet, which is you can set up a website very cheaply. Um, and then from there, I managed to get a grant to set up to run the radio station, which again, for, for some time, um, covered the running costs of the, um, of the website. Um, that ended, and I had to start asking for donations. Uh, for, and, and I was really touched. Um, we got some wonderful, I got some wonderful donors all from Malaysia. Some of them are very small amounts of money that come in every month. And together, together they fund the basic running costs of the website. Um, I don't take a salary. Thank you. Well, Claire, uh, that's been uh, a wonderful night listening uh, to you telling us in far away Hobart here at this ninth Hobart oration about um, what's going on in the country equivalent uh, in population roughly to Australia, but with echoes that we in Tasmania and, and Australia hear very clearly. 
uh, and uh, particularly uh, the idea that corruption can't slide further and further uh, without there's watchdog dogs in place is one that uh, we should never let ourselves believe. And it's the fourth estate, the journalists and the investigative journalists not least, who are so important to not just getting the information right for the populace that votes, but to digging deeper when they can. And they're, they're uh, not a common breed. You uh, are an exemplar. Um, you've got our environmental prize. This all came out uh, and will, I think, there will be much more to be unfolding in Malaysia because of your work and the work of others uh, in the coming years. I don't think Ta'i will continue to get away with it. Certainly, we will continue at this end to keep uh, our scrutiny on Ta'an, uh, which is brother-in-law, if I'm not wrong, um, uh, effectively... Cousin. Cousin. Cousin effectively controls, which has its uh, factories in North, uh, at Smithton and uh, Judbury and is uh, responsible, for example, for the driving force for the destruction of the Laboina Forest two years ago, is now a, a major recipient of the logging out of uh, the Tarkine uh, and Southern Forests and sometimes those beautiful logs you see going through this city are on their way to Tar An. Uh, and if there's profit in it, ultimately to line the pockets of billionaires uh, of the sort that Claire Rucastle brown has been up against. Uh, in the world today, there's a lot that worries us. But uh, we need to stop every now and then to look at those things which anchor us against a much worse world and give us hope for the future. And uh, we've got one of those with us tonight. Claire, uh, you are... A human being, but one who's shown extraordinary courage, intelligence, diligence. I know there's much more you haven't told us about tonight. Uh, for example, the threat of lawsuits which are raining in on you at any given time from massively wealthy people uh, for whom, against whom you just don't have the money to be running uh, equal um, legal teams and so on. But uh, for all of that, we're very grateful you're here tonight. Uh, uh, we wish you well. We're going, Claire and I are off to uh, Melbourne Monash University tomorrow, uh, then to the ANU with the Australia Institute in Canberra on Wednesday night. So let folk know up there if, um, they, uh, if they can to come along to those events. In the meantime, it's an honour to be hosting you here in Hobart, Claire, and uh, thank you for what you've done for Malaysia and for the planet. Well, well, thank you. And Bob, what I want to say is, you know, thank you all of you, because um, you all turned out tonight, and, and it makes all the difference, as, as you all know as campaigners, many of you, um, that it's, it's that engagement and that encouragement and support um, that, that keeps someone like me, and there are lots of us here tonight, keeps us going. Um, and um, the amazing support I've had from so many Malaysians um, as well, uh, is what's kept me going. So I know I'm not alone, and, and the fact that you're all here tonight has, has reminded me and reinforced that. So thank you so much, and, and thank you for that wonderful honour of, of that environment prize. Um, it's so, so special to me at a time when I've been covering what seemed to be high politics and finance. Ladies and gentlemen, Claire Rucastle Brown.